think we're there. Amen. Well, good morning, church. <clears throat> you know, uh, today's message I, I have to share with you I was born from an inspiration last week as I was uh, sitting here. Uh, some of you guys know that I usually preach on the second Sundays. But last week, Pastor had asked that he could uh, swap with me because he was going to go on this hunting trip. And so uh, we were, uh, I was sitting here and I had had a message that the Lord had given me a few weeks ago that I had prepared and was ready to, to present to you. Uh, but as I was sitting here on last Sunday, uh, the Spirit of the Lord just interrupted me and dropped this teaching into my spirit uh, with the word to share it with you today. So I can honestly say, thus saith the Lord. But with that having been said, I will need you to pray with me so that God may be glorified in it. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the opportunity to bring this word before your people. We're asking you to bless it now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Um, as is my custom, I, I very often will fall into a habit of what we call preaching because that's just the, my, my bent is, is in that type of presentation. But today, I want to share a teaching with you. In other words, I want you to put your thinking caps on. Uh, we want to move you emotionally because that's part of how God made you. But I also want to move you intellectually because that is also how God made you. I want to move you into a form of thinking that hopefully will direct a course of action. So I want to begin this morning by sharing a quote with you. Uh, this quote comes from a book that was written in around the mid 1800s. It was written by an American congreg Congregationalist pastor by the name of Austin Phelps. Not the swimmer, uh, but this was a theologian. In his book called The Steel Hour, and this is an hour that's committed to the topic and the discipline of prayer. He writes, a plain man once said, before my conversion, when I prayed in the presence of others, I prayed to them. When I prayed in secret, I prayed to myself. But now I pray to God. So what he points out in this simple statement is that there is a correct way and an incorrect way to pray. We're always requesting that you as members of this church join us in intercessory prayer. And we're trying to build that up, to bring it to a place where we can be satisfying and pleasing to God, but also that where we can see the results of our prayers. It's not enough for us to simply come together and to bow our heads and say, in Jesus' name, and then to walk away and then do life the best we can. Because if it could make it on just doing it the best we could, then God wouldn't have given us the vehicle of prayer. But in order to have those prayer needs met, God has given us a basis for doing that. So we have to start off. The first thing I want you to put in your thinking cap is this. Prayer can be done incorrectly. And if it's done incorrectly, there's a great chance you will not get what you desire. Is that simple enough? How many of you guys have had prayer failures? Okay, that's how we learn, right? We learn God allows us to have failures so we can go, oops, don't do that again. The problem is we get and do it again. <laughs> so we want to get to the point where we stop doing it again. Now, I want to lay a foundation. Before I give you the, the substance of what this, this, this teaching is about today, I want to go back and lay a little foundation, something that pastor said last week where the Lord spoke to my heart. And that's in the book of Joshua. If you remember last week, God, uh, pastor was talking through, God was speaking through pastor about entering into the promised land. And he gave us the example of Jericho. How when they went into the promised land, the very first city they took was one of the most well fortified and defended cities in the promised land. And yet God had given Joshua some instructions on how to take the promised land. And we know how he went in and the first day they walked around it one time and up to the sixth day one time each. And then on that Sabbath day or that seventh day, they walked around it seven times. And all that week before, they were instructed to not say a word, not to even talk amongst themselves. 
But on Friday, they were to give a shout unto the Lord and to attack the wall. And the Bible says that the wall fell in on itself. In other words, God pushed it down. And they went in and they spoiled the city. Well, so where I want to take up today, open your Bibles, please, to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to read a few verses out of chapter 6 up to verse uh, 27. And then we're going to go on. But let's go from, let's start there. This is after that's all done. This is after Joshua and the nation of Israel have celebrated their victory. It says, then the Israelites burned the whole city and everything in it, except for the things made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron. These put, they, uh, put, they put these things in the Lord's sanctuary. Joshua saved Rahab the prostitute, her family, and all those who were with her. Joshua let them live because Rahab helped the spies Joshua had sent into, out to Jericho. Rahab still lives among the Israelites today. At that time, Joshua made this important promise. He said, whoever rebuilds Jericho will be in danger from the Lord. When he lays the foundation, he will lose his oldest son. When he sets up the gates, he will lose his youngest son. So the Lord was with Joshua and Joshua became famous throughout the whole country. Now, what I want to lay down as a foundation here is this. They were doing exactly what God told them to do. God told them to go into the promised land and to possess the promised land and to do that by dispossessing the inhabitants. In other words, kick the people out who are there now and take what's theirs. But in the case of the city of Jericho, he told them very specific, gave them specific instructions on how to be successful. He said, I want you to walk around one time a day for six days without uttering a word. Then on the seventh day, you are to shout and scream and go in and take it. And all the spoils of that city, of course, we know belong to the Lord. Now we're going to continue reading, going into verse 1, going into chapter 7. Let's read the first seven verses, the first five or seven verses. But, and it's usually not a good thing when it starts a sentence with but. But the Israelites did not obey God. There was a man from the tribe of Judah named Achan, son of Camry, son of Zimri, great-grandson of Zerah. Achan kept some of the things that should have been destroyed. So the Lord became very angry with the Israelites. After they defeated Jericho, Joshua sent men into Ai. Ai was near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel. He told them, go to Ai and look for the weakness in that area. So the men went to spy on the land. Later the men came back to Joshua. They said, Ai is a weak area. We will not need all of our people to defeat, the, to defeat them. Send 2,000 or maybe 3,000 men to fight there. There is no need to use the whole army. There are only a few men there to fight against us. So about 3,000 men went to Ai, but the people of Ai killed about 36 men of Israel. And the Israelites ran away. The people of Ai chased them from the city gates all the way to the quarries. The people of Ai beat them badly. When the people of Israel saw this, they became very frightened and they lost their courage. Now, what we want to do is take the principle of this lesson and we're going to apply that to prayer. In the first level of instruction, God told the children of Israel exactly what they were supposed to do. To march around the city, then again, like I said, on the seventh day to go around seven times and then to give this great shout. But in going in and plundering the city, they were to keep none of those things unto themselves. They're supposed to take everything, burn everything down, but the, the jewel, the gold to bring back and put into, tre into the treasury of the Lord. The key thing I want you to focus on is the compliance to instruction. That was a very specific thing they were supposed to do in the way they were supposed to do it. It's also important to understand that they were attacking this city under the instructions of God. They spoiled the city under the instruction of God. They did all that, all that goes along with warfare, they did under the instructions of God. And they came out with the victory until Achan put his hand on something that didn't belong to him. So now you'll see the pattern. Joshua now has had a pattern that's worked. He sent people in to spy out the land, kind of got a feel for it, came back, and then went and attacked the land. So he uses the same pattern with Ai. 
He says, go spy out the land. They go spy out, they come back with a good report. Oh, we can take these guys. We just took Jericho, we can take these guys. Matter of fact, they're so small, you only need about 3,000 people. So Joshua says, go ahead, take 3,000 soldiers, go do it. Now you see how the pattern looks just like the one before? It looks just like the one before. It looks like it should work. They don't have many men to defend the city. We're all pumped up because we just got through kicking the devil's butt. And now we're going to step in here in AI and take everything they got. Except for one thing. They were in disobedience. They missed the instruction. Now I want you to understand that when it comes to prayer, the same two things that caused Joshua and the nation of Israel to fail is what causes you to fail in your prayer life. Two little things. If you want the answer to why you fail in your prayer life, here they are, church. Write these down. Ignorance and arrogance. Those are the two things that cause you to fail. Ignorance and arrogance. You see, they were ignorant of what was really happening. They didn't know what they should have done. They didn't take the time to find out what needed to happen. Because when he did stop to find out what happened, God told him. When he did stop and say, why can't we go forward? God said, there's a block in the path. There's disobedience. You have to take care of that. And then God told them the battle plan on how to take Ai. But because of the ignorance they were operating under, they presumed upon past behavior that they can just do it the way they did last time. And therefore, they would have the same level of success. Now, this is not in your notes, but write this down. Psalms 19, David says at the end of that psalm, Lord, keep your servant back from the presumptuous sin. Keep me from presuming on you, Lord. Now, the way we keep from presuming on the Lord is stay in intimate contact with the Lord. When I'm talking to God and he's giving me instructions, I don't have to presume. I just have to listen and obey. It's really simple. That's why prayer is so simple that a child can do it and have great success. And that's the same reason so many adults do it and fail over and over and over. Ignorance and arrogance. Ignorance is things you don't know. So how does arrogance come into play? Arrogance has two folds. In the case of Joshua and these guys, well, we had just had a victory. We just kicked Jericho's behind. And they are much bigger than Ai. They had a well-fortified city. They got a massive army. This is just a little town. We can take them. They had a lot of confidence in themselves. And when it comes to prayer, guys, this arrogance won't allow us to be taught. We parade in our ignorance. And we do stuff and we do things because it was done that way before. I saw somebody else do it. I did it this way last time. And we keep doing it. But yet there is a pattern set for victory. The thing that Joshua did not do before Ai that he did do before Jericho, he went out and met with the Lord. And when he met with the Lord, his ignorance was destroyed. God gave him information. God gave him not only knowledge, but he gave him wisdom. He gave him the information of what he needed to do, but he also told them how to do it. So ignorance was completely destroyed. The only thing left was whether or not Joshua would obey. And he, for his sake, obeyed. And 99.9% .9 of the rest of the nation obeyed. But one guy didn't. Now just take, for instance, now, if Joshua had not gotten trapped in ignorance, 
if he had gone out and set aside his arrogance, the assumption that he knew what he was going to have to do, the assumption that he knew what needed to be done and he knew how to do it. If he had laid that aside and went out in his ignorance like he did before, oh God, we got this big city up here ahead of us and I'm not sure how are we going to take care of this. But he didn't do that. He didn't go out. He didn't come into the presence of God. Had he gone out, the same God that promised to lead him would have led him. Why? Because we know for a fact that God cannot be unfaithful. You and I, we mess it up sometimes. And sometimes we mess it up while we're trying to do our absolute best. There's times when you really plan to do well and you just forget. I, I, I did that this week. I just forgot to tell my wife something. I was like, oh, stupid. I had every intention of telling her, I just forgot to tell her. Best of plans, right? But God never forgets. God never, ooh, that slipped my mind. God had promised to lead Joshua. So we know for a fact, and I say, I'm hitting this nail on the head repeatedly because I want you to understand the faithfulness of God. God cannot lie. If he promises anything, you can write it down. Matter of fact, he did. We can trust the word of God. But what gets us trapped is when we stop in that arrogance that says, I don't need to do it that way. We have liberty in God. It is true. We don't have liberty from God. Do you understand the difference between that? We have liberty in God. We don't have liberty from God. I shared this with someone in the last couple of weeks. My brother worked on, he retired the same time I did, and he retired working on the, the railroad. He was talking about the importance of the gauge of the tracks and all the things they had to do to keep the gauge the exact width and all the things that go wrong with heat and cold and snow and water and animals and people. They very often have to go check the tracks to make sure the train can pass over. And I was not aware of all the things they had to do all the time. The reason being, there is freedom on the tracks. If the train comes off the track, it's not free. It's free on the tracks. Just like you and I, when we are on the track of God's word, we are free. When we're off the track, we will have some movement. You ever seen a train wreck? You will have some movement but will come to a sudden and violent end. And then that's where the mess starts. You can get movement off of God's will, but it will end badly. And the only way to get that train moving again is to lift it up and put it back on the track. So what we want to do is get back on the track. Now open your Bibles, please, to the Deuteronomy chapter 12. One of the things we discovered as we've been going through our study in the Pentateuch is the, 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 the pattern that God has given us in the Old Testament. We see that when God took the nation of Israel out of Egypt, it was a type of being born again. Egypt representing the world, uh, Pharaoh representing the king of the world, which is i.e. Satan, and then all the power that was at his control. And then we understand that when they came out of Egypt, they entered in what the Bible calls the Bidamar or the wilderness, that place of wandering. And what we have discovered is, is that in that place from Egypt to the border of the promised land is where God was teaching the children of Israel to become, for lack of a better word, the children of God. I think sometimes we romanticize the idea that when the children of Israel were in Egypt, they were this godly people. They were not. They were idol worshipers. They were heathens, okay? The only difference is, is that they had a covenant with God through their father Abraham. The covenant was based not on Abraham, but on God, right? God said, I swear by my own name. That's a whole different teaching, but we'll talk about the fact that by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works lest any man should boast, right? It's, it's a gift of God. And that's what coming out of Egypt was all about. But once they came out of Egypt and got into this wilderness, they're wandering around and God allowed them to go through these different experiences so they could learn how to be governed by God. They learned that God would provide all their needs. They knew that God would be their defender. God would be their direction giver. And all those things they learned, they learned how to follow God. When you get born again, you come out of Egypt, you still have all your heathenous ways. 
You have all your heathenist tendencies. The, the carnal man still lives inside you. The spirit man is now awake. He's alive for the first time. You must be born again. That spirit man comes alive and now you must learn to walk in the spirit. In the same way that the nation of Israel had to learn to walk following the spirit. When it was dark, they had a pillow of fire. When it was too bright, they had a cloud by day. When it was dry, they got water from the rock. Who's the rock? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. All right. When they were hungry, they got bread from heaven. Who was the bread of heaven? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. You see how God was providing for them, teaching them that he would be all that they needed. All they had to do was follow him. That's where you are as you come out of Egypt and you go into a spiritual maturity. Now you cross over into Jordan and the first thing that God says to you is that when you go into Jordan, it is going to be a fight. There's going to be a fight because there's people who live in the promised land who've been living there for 400 years and they think the promised land belongs to them. Just like when you got saved, those old habits acted like you belong to them. They still want you to drink and drive and act a fool. They still want you to watch porn. They still want you to slip around and cheat. They still want you to lie. They still want you to do all those things. Those inhabitants are still trying to get you to act as if you're still in Egypt. So when you come out of Egypt and you get into the wilderness, you learn to kick off those things because I have someone I can trust. But there comes a point in time where God says, now you're crossing over into the promised land. It's time to grow up. And you'll see that message over and over again in the New Testament. The one, probably one of the most prominent one is in I, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 going into chapter 6 where he says you ought to be uh, uh, teaching others by now, but you still need the milk of the word. He says, it's time for you to grow up. He says the same thing in Corinthians where Paul says, check yourself. See if you're yet in the faith unless you are reprobate. Over and over again, we see these warnings to the people of God that says, you should be growing up. You've been out of Egypt for 40 years. You've been wandering and wandering across the, the, the wilderness now. Now you're crossing over to Jordan. And this is what we find ourselves in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Let's read verses 8 through 11. We see this principle where God is speaking through Moses and Moses is reminding the nation of Israel of everything they've gone through for the last 40 years. And he says now, starting in verse 8, you must not continue to worship the way we have been worshiping. Now stop right there. If you're me, that should give you great pause. God is telling the nation of Israel, stop worshiping the way you've been worshiping. So what does that tell us about worship, guys? teaching lesson. There's a right way and a wrong way. So when you come into the house of God, you come in to worship God, there's a right way to worship and there's a wrong way to worship. Now some of you guys got little bells going off in your head going, oh, you're getting under the law. You're getting under the law. No, we're getting on the tracks. There's freedom on the tracks. You follow what I'm trying to say to you? Off the tracks, there's no freedom. Off the track is very fast movement and a very violent stop. We crash and we burn. On the tracks, we can go all over the country. So God is saying to the nation of Israel here, you must not continue to worship the way you have been worshiping. He says, until now, you see, there's a point that comes. Until now, each of us has been worshiping God any way we want it. This is because we have not yet entered the peaceful land that the Lord your God is giving you. But you will cross over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God has given you. There he will give you rest from your enemies and you will be safe. Then the Lord your God will choose a place that will be the home for his name. You must bring everything I commanded you to that place. Bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, one tenth of your crops and your animals and special gifts and any gifts that you promise to give to the Lord. Now we find here that God is saying something very specific. There is a point in time where you must grow up. Remember, he had given them the Levitical code while they were in the wilderness. Remember, they built the tabernacle. Remember that? They did all that. But because they were transitory, sometimes the tabernacle, would, the spirit would stop. They only be there for a day. Sometimes they'd be there for a month or a week. Sometimes they'd be there for a year. But when you have a transitory camp, you can't do all the things that the Levitical code required you to do. So God says, I accepted your worship the way you could give it to me when you were in the wilderness because you were transitory. You were growing up. You were moving. 
But now when you come into maturity, you need to do things my way for your good. I'm trying to teach you something. This will help you. If you will let the word of God be the foundation and the rule of your life, you will find freedom. Presumption, ignorance, and arrogance will destroy the fruitfulness of your spiritual life. We ask this question over and over again, why do you think God kept saying the same things over and over and over? And then I looked in the mirror and I got the answer. It's because you're stupid. Now, I don't know what your mirror said, but that's what my mirror said. My mirror said, because you're stupid. Now, I have a simple definition. I used to talk to the kids when I teach them. I say, now, ignorance is when you don't know something. Because they get mad when I call them ignorant. So I ask them a question. I said, what did I have for breakfast this morning? I don't know. I wasn't at your house. That's exactly. You're ignorant. You did not know. But if I tell you what the answer to the question is and you still do wrong, what does that make you? It makes you stupid. When you know what's right and you choose to do wrong, what does that make you? That doesn't, you're not ignorant. You're stupid. I mean, that's what my mirror said to me. Your mirror might be nicer. But my mirror just looked at me and said, boy, he better get this together. You cannot afford to continue in stupidity. See, God's grace and his mercy covers our, us uh, to a large degree when we're ignorant. That's even a sacrifice that, that God required the nation of Israel to give for sins that they did not even know they committed. God, God knows our frame. Now, all this is in Christ, so we, it's a whole different revelation in the New Testament, but we, the same principles apply. So I'm trying to get you to understand that if we can get past that, especially in this thing called prayer. Now, all this is still part of your introduction to teaching. It's very short. This is all introduction. We got to get past the presumption that because I saw some success like this, I can skip this middle part where I got to go back to God. And I can just do what I did last time and I'll have success. Or I can do what I saw this brother do and I can have success. And when it comes to prayer, God, it is very important that we do things God's way. Now, there is a cure for arrogance. Anybody know what that is? Somebody said, what? Jesus. Well, the answer is always Jesus. You can't go there. Come on. <laughs> Humility, right? Humility. How many of you guys ever had, let me say this over. How many of you guys ever been humbled by somebody? You know, when you think you all that and then you get humbled. How, come on, anybody been there besides me? When you think you got some, I remember this one time, I told you guys this story a long time ago, so some of you guys heard it. I was a bit of a fighter when I was growing up. I know you can't tell now because I'm so pretty, but I fought a lot when I was a child. And then my reputation got ahead of me. And so a lot of people wouldn't fight me because they knew I, would, I was kind of crazy like that. So they wouldn't fight me at all. And this one guy, his name was Peanut. I don't know why they call him Peanut. <laughs> but Peanut had heard about me too. And so I walked up on Peanut one day and I forget what we was going to fight about, but I grabbed Peanut. But I looked in his eyes and Peanut had the desperation of someone who was like, you're going to know you've been in a fight, boy. And I grabbed that boy and he grabbed me back. And I came to the sudden revelation, I really don't want to fight Peanut. Because <laughs> why I'm out here just acting a fool, this boy's serious. And so I grabbed him by his collar and I pushed him away. And I said, you better be glad I don't feel like fighting you today. <laughs> and he was like, <gasps> I said, get out of here. And he took off running. And I was like, whew. Because <laughs> I knew if I had fought Peanut that day, it had went bad for me. See, sometimes you get humble. I, I got humble before I got knocked out that time, but there's been times when I found myself on the back going, ooh, ooh, what was those lights in my eyes? You know, because somebody hit you upside the head with something, and you're like, oh my gosh, that hurt. So that's what it feels like when someone hits you. Okay, that's cool. You get humbled. So we can humble ourselves, or we can wait and be humbled by God. 
You see, it took 36 families to have people buried in order for Israel to be humbled. They came out of Jericho and they had that place of arrogance. It took 36 people dying for them to be humbled. Here's the question I have for you. What will it take to humble you? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. See, when God puts you down, it's only to bring you up. When the devil puts you down, it's to try to take you out. So what will it take to humble you? Now, we're ready. We're finally ready to go forward. Everybody's ready, right? The two things that stops prayer, ignorance and arrogance. The cure is humility. We get rid of our ignorance by going to the one who has instructions on how to do it. That's what we're going to do. Open your Bibles down to Luke chapter 11. Very basic instruction this morning. But guys, it's so basic, I think the majority of the church misses it. It's like when you become over familiar with something. Somebody starts talking to you, oh, I know what you're going to say. And so you don't really hear it. So we're going to slow down and hear the word of God this morning. Remembering that there's a right way and a wrong way to pray. Just like God told the nation of Israel, when you were out there in the wilderness and you were traveling through, I accepted your worship the way it was. But now that you're coming into the place of maturity, I expect you to do it right. And the same thing is true of us. God says, there is times when I've accepted your sloppy praying, but now it's time to do it right. And the reason we have to do it right, guys, is because the battle is real. Joshua and Israel found that out. 36 funerals later, they found out that the battle was real. And so what we have to do now is get it. Everybody got Luke chapter 1, or chapter 11, verse 1? Here is the first point where we can destroy our ignorance. And we demonstrate humility. It says, and it came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, such a simple thing. Lord, teach us to pray. That's how it must begin. When we come in and we assume that we know everything we need to know, we don't look for instruction. We're like Joshua at AI. I just start making decisions, setting things downstream. Go do this, go do that. <coughs> Excuse me. And we expect that we're going to have the will and the purposes of God while we are directing the show. So the first thing we have to do is say, God, teach me how to pray. Now, when we come to prayer, there is a, a template that God has given us. And that template has eight separate and distinct sections of how to have proper prayer. Now, this morning, church, I'm talking to you about the foundation of prayer. There's different types of prayer, different circumstances and situations. I'm talking to you about the basic foundation of prayer. This is what everything else is going to be built off of, okay? So right now, let's talk about that. Go back to Matthew chapter 5, I was chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 6. We're going to read about seven verses, and you'll see in those seven verses, there are eight distinct principles that God has given us for prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. 6 through 13. Here we go. Are we there yet? Yes, sir. Okay, here we go. Jesus is talking to his disciples. This is the same setting that we just read in Luke, but I want to give you that, hist that, that foundation out of Luke to tell you how we got here. Jesus was involved in the Sermon on the Mount. He's now giving this instruction on prayer. He says, starting in verse 6, but you... Here we go again. We start off a sentence with but, right? That means there's a contrast coming here somewhere. So he's contrasting you, you being those who are believers, those who are disciples, against those who are not. We understand that? So there should be a difference between how we as Christians pray and those who are not Christians pray. There should be a difference. That's the first thing we notice. He says, but you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father which is in secret. And your father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. 
But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Do not, do not be like them, for your Father knows what things you have need of even before you ask. Because of that, you should pray in this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, eight sections, guys, that keeps you on the tracks in your prayer life. This first section is probably the place where we miss it the most. The first section, we're going to break it down and we're going to label it and look at it. The first section is heart preparation. Heart preparation. He says, but when you pray, enter into your closet. That means you're going to need to separate yourself from the distractions of life. Put yourself in a position where you can be with God, where you can talk to God. He says, and when you're there, pray to your father, which is in secret. Here it goes again, heart preparation. For your father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. What does that tell you about your attitude in prayer? Somebody tell me. What does that statement say about your, what your attitude should be in prayer? Anybody? Huh? There's a humility involved, but there is something he's telling you here. He says, when you pray in secret, he said, your father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. What does that tell you? You pray with an expectancy. See, that's part of the heart preparation. I'm praying in secret, but my father shall reward me. Oh, but he shall what? Re what is a reward? Something you get, right? So if I'm asking for something and God's going to give it to me, then I have an expectancy that God's going to do what God said he would do. So there is an expectancy that I go into prayer with. I don't go into prayer to talk myself up like the pep squad at school. I go in preparing myself, knowing that even as I go in to pray, God already knows what I need. Even before I bend my knee, he knows what I need, and he's already willing to reward me. That's an expectancy. Now, th now, before you guys think I'm getting stupid, remember who said this? Who's talking here, guys? Jesus. Okay, Jesus. So this is good stuff. This is not something that Pastor Ray and Pastor Mike cooked up in the back room. This is real Bible. So you can understand that when I go into prayer, I have an expectancy on the character of God that I can trust his heart for me. He goes on and says, but when you pray, do not use vain repetition. Don't do as the heathen do. Don't go there. So I'm going to prepare my heart as I go and I'm going to separate myself to get on with God. Next, I'm going to go in with the expectancy that God's going to hear me and he's going to reward me as I pray. Then we're going to know that once I get in, I ain't got to be all stupid jumping through religious hoops. I can just talk to my father. Now, if you like to pray in King James language, do it. I don't care. Who cares? God speaks all languages. It doesn't matter. Just don't be vain. Don't go in there and stretch out the vowels because you think that's going to impress God. But don't get there and talk in trash either, think you're going to impress God. Be respectful, be honest, but be sincere. You don't use special words when you're talking to God. He knows, he created the words, you know what they mean. Just talk to him. But you're going to prepare your heart with this before you even get to, to starting the prayer. This is me preparing myself. Now, my wife does a better job of this than I do. I go to cook. I just go cook. My wife gets the kitchen ready to cook, which never makes any sense to me. <laughs> Why clean up the kitchen before you get it dirty? It just never made any sense to me. But this is what God is saying. He's saying, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself to pray. Don't just walk in. Oh, yeah, God, I got this thing happening. Thank you. I'm out. See you. Bye. 
Now there is, uh, we're not talking about the applications, we'll talk about that later, okay? Because there are times when you just cry like Peter, Lord save me! There's times for that. There's other times where the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. See what I'm saying? There's a whole span of it. But right now we're talking about the foundation that makes prayer work. Y'all with me on that? Okay, so we have to have that preparation of our hearts. Prepare our hearts. Know what God, the character of God, we're going to separate ourselves to be with God, and we're going to do this with the expect, expectancy that God cannot lie. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. The second thing we do, now we've gotten to this place where we've prepared ourselves, the very next thing we do is another place where we often fail in prayer. The first thing, the biggest fail I see in the saints of God is a lack of that preparation of the heart. The second thing is opening worship. Opening worship. See how God, Jesus said, Jesus says, but when you pray, pray in this manner. Now he gets into the bread and the butter. He says, he says our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Opening worship. God's not your buddy. The Bible tells us that he's a friend of sinners. He's a friend of yours, but he's not your buddy. He's not your pal. He's God. He's God. Sometimes in our attempt to make God seem relevant to people, we make him common. He's God. Reverence him. Honor him. Worship him. First thing you're going to do is prepare your heart. Get ready to go into prayer. You're going to have the mindset that God has already heard your prayers. He knows what you have need of even before you. He knows your needs better than you do. I can't tell you how many times I've gone before the Lord to seek his face and the answer comes before I even start praying. And then there's times I had to seek his face and seek his face and I find out the answer was there but I didn't see it. And there's times when I felt like we crashed and burned, it was over. But then God came through and you find out, oh no, he's right on time. Honor him. Take time to worship him. Now we could do a whole bunch of teaching on worshiping God, but we're not doing that today. We're just talking about the parts, okay? The second part, or should I say the next part so I don't get my numbers mixed up, is submission to his will and the desire for his glory. Now, the following principle of this, we see it in, in the book of James, right? When James says, you can have whatever you want, just don't ask a misc. That, that's part about asking with, for God's glory. So we say here, how does he say that? He goes, thy kingdom come. What is the kingdom, guys? What's the kingdom? Huh? No. See, that's one of the mistakes we make. It's not heaven. The kingdom of heaven is in the hearts of men. That's what the Bible says, right? So what is the kingdom? What is a kingdom? A kingdom is what? What is a kingdom? Just in general speaking, what is a kingdom? Okay. It's the realm of authority. It's the realm of authority. If I'm in the kingdom of America, that means I'm where America rules. Okay? So we're going to ask for thy kingdom come. The rule and the authority of God to come. Primarily come where? Point at yourself first. Okay? We're going to prepare our hearts. We're going to worship God. And now we're going to desire his kingdom, his authority in whatever situation we're seeking. We want his kingdom. And he goes on and says, he goes, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So whatever the status of heaven is, especially as it relates to what we're praying for, that's what we're asking God to do here. Now you begin to understand why Jesus could say to us later, whatsoever things you ask for, my Father will do it. Why? Because you're praying for his will. You're praying for his exact will to manifest itself in your situation. So if you're asking for something that God already wants, that he already wants to give you, what's your odds of getting it? Pretty high. Pretty high. Doesn't mean that you don't have something to learn in the process. Doesn't mean he doesn't put you through a trial so you can strengthen your faith, but the odds of having that prayer request satisfied is pretty high. So we have to go back to it. We're gonna prepare our hearts, we're gonna worship, and we're gonna seek his glory and his will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in me, 
in this church, in this circumstance, or this situation, even as it would be done, Lord, if we were in heaven. That's what I want to see right here, right now. How many of you guys having trouble believing what I'm saying? Anybody? Well, you might as well be honest. God can see your heart. I don't need to lie to him. He can see you. But this is how we get there, right? We challenge ourselves. We say, God, ugh, that sounds a bit steep, Jesus, but I'm reading it in the book, so it must be true. And then we do like my grandson does. Up. Oh. It's gotten to the point he, didn't even, he don't even try to climb anymore. He sees someone on the counter, he goes, grab that, up. Oh. He grabs what he wants. So simple. But that's why we as adults miss it so much, because we're too smart for our own good. You're too smart. We think ourselves right out of the will of God. Now, we've gotten to this place. Now, the next thing is the appeal for the felt need. What is it that's driving you to God? Give us this day our daily bread. That's not just food. It's not just food. What is your felt need? What is driving you to this place now? And this is where you're asking God, be specific for what you want God to do. You prepare your heart, you worship him, you got your place, self in a place where you're seeking his in the earth. Now tell him what you want. And all things be anxious for what? But with prayer and thanksgiving, let your be what? In other words, tell God about it. Stop whining and fussing. Stop crying. Get in a line with God. Get out of the rocks. Get back on the tracks. Stoke the engine a little bit. Get the fire going and ride the rail. Get in a line with God's will. Tell God what they felt need is. And now once we get here, the next thing we're going to do is make sure, and this is why I have to thank my brother James for this, because he told me how they constantly have to gauge those tracks. I don't know if I share this with you or not. You guys seen the little cars drive down the railroad track? Have you seen that? I always thought they were just going to go work on the track or going to find something. He goes, no, those cars have tracks, the, the train track that's at a certain gauge. And as they go, they pull those tracks into perfect alignment. That's where they're resetting the track. And they check. Wherever there's been a thought or a fear or a danger or damage to a track, they will drive through and make sure that that track is the right gauge so when that train comes through later on with those thousands of tons of steel moving at 45, 50 miles an hour, it can just get right through there. None of this, none of that. Just. And so this is what we're seeing. And now we got to come to this next stage. This is where we reset the gauge, and that is reasserting righteousness. Jesus says, now if we say, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We talked about this Friday night. Why is this so important? Now, to me, I hear people teach all the time when Jesus says stuff like, if you don't forgive your trespassers, neither will God forgive you. People teach all around that. I just think it's too simple. The word of God is very basic. He didn't say iniquities. He said trespasses. Trespasses are things that you do wrong. Right? Right? Okay, so what does the Bible tell us that God does to his kids when they don't correct the sin in their life? Okay, so when you're in sin that you haven't cleaned up, God whoops that, I'm sorry, spanks that behind, <laughs> right? God takes you to the woodshed and he spanks you behind, right? That's what the Bible says, Hebrew says that, right? Same principle here. Now forgive us our debts. I want to make sure that I'm in right alignment with God. I got the gauge on now. I'm going to forgive Anything that's against me so that I don't have anything that God's going to hold back and block this blessing. I want to be God. I want to forgive everybody. Just let it go. Forgive it. I want to forgive even as you have forgiven me. And you go on and you study through Matthew, it'll tell you if you don't forgive, neither will your father forgive you. So that trespass, that offense is still held against you. And that's going to block your blessing. So we're going to prepare our hearts. We're going to open up in worship. We're going to submit and surrender to his will and for his glory. We're going to give the felt need. We're going to reassert ourselves in the righteousness. We're going to forgive and get in right, get right standing with God. The next thing we're going to do, 
because we realize that even as we're praying, even as we're seeking these things, that there's a very real enemy who wants to destroy you. The Bible says what? Satan comes but to steal, kill, and? And that the Satan is like a roaring lion seeking? So we know we have to do some warfare, warfare right? Paul told us to put on the what? The whole? See, all this stuff tells you that this battle is real. And there's things you have to do in order to succeed. We'll talk about the armor some other day, and we'll talk about the lion prowling some other day, but right now we're talking about you. Right now we're talking about protection and direction. And he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So now we're going to prepare our hearts. We're going to open in worship. We're going to submit to his will and for his glory. We're going to appeal to the felt need. Then we're going to get ourselves in right standing with God. And now we're going to say, Lord, I need your protection in this battle. I need your direction. All this applied to what we're praying for. Lord, what's, how do I do this? What do you want me to do? How do I get to the place I'm going to get to? It's not about repeating the words of the prayer. It's about applying the principle of the prayer. Because if we just repeat the words and it becomes like a song we're singing, it has just that much meaning. We can sing the words all day long. They're not magic words. It's not like Alibaba's cave, right? Open sesame. It don't work just because you say it. This, this word has to be applied in faith. So it's not about repeating the words. It's about applying the principle. So now I'm coming. I'm looking for direction. I'm looking for protection. God, lead me. Remember Joshua? Are you for us or are you for our enemy? I'm not for either one of you, but I'm the captain of the Lord's host. The question is, are you on my side? Okay, tell me what to do. Lead me. You see what I'm saying? When I go in there, protect me. Because there's an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your finances. He wants to destroy your joy, your health, your happiness. He wants to destroy it all. And if you don't take the word seriously, the devil will eat your lunch. And that's why so many believers walk around bound. Because we're not preparing for the battle correctly. That's a different teaching too. Okay, now we come to that part of the prayer. We come down toward the end here. He says, uh, the next uh, section is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What does that sound like, guys? Worship. You open in worship, you close in worship. Why? Because he's worthy. Now, that's not the last thing. The last thing in that prayer is what? It's one word. It's one word sentence. What is it? And it means what? And so be it means what? It's done, right? So we end in faith. You follow me so far? We're going to prepare our hearts as we come in before the Lord. We're going to go in to worship for who he is. We're going to find ourselves submitting to his will and then looking for his glory. Then we're going to appeal to the felt need. From that point, we're going to have the reassertion of righteousness, put ourselves in right standing with God. We're going to look for his protection, his direction. Then we're going to end in worship. But that's not the end of our prayer. Now we hold it in faith. We say amen. So be it. Another example of that is when young Mary was talking to the angel. Remember that? It's Christmas, so we can talk about it. It's all right. And, and uh, the angel said to her, you're going to have this baby. And she goes, how's this going to be? I'm still a virgin. And he says, the spirit of God is going to come over you. And that child that's conceived in your womb is going to be of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be called the son of God. And she said what? She said, so be it. Be it unto me according to thy will. So be it. And that's what we're called to do now. So be it. Now, this is one of those things we refer to, and I'm not trying to change habits and culture. I'm, I don't care about that. Just get it right. But we often refer to this as the Lord's Prayer. And, and you understand, once you see what we're talking about here, there is no circumstance at ever that Jesus could pray this prayer. Jesus never sinned, so what would he need to be forgiven for? Okay, you follow what I'm saying? So this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is the disciples' prayer. This is what you and I pray. This is not what Jesus prays. You want to see how Jesus prays for his own self? Look at John 17. That's the high priestly prayer. This is what we do. This is how we pray. Okay? So what I want you to do is take this principle and apply it to your life. Because God has given us this as a way of, of deliverance. I'm going to bring this to an end. 
There's a one set of scripture I want to share with you before we go. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14, and we'll start at verse 15. Because I'll tell you right now, this is what the enemy in the flesh will say to you. The enemy in the flesh will say, you don't need to do that. That's what babies do when they first start. You, you're too mature for that now. You don't need to follow that pattern. You can just go in and pray. You're way beyond that. We translate that as arrogance. Okay, we translate it as arrogance. Because when I read this passage in, in Matthew's gospel, and Luke's gospel, there's nowhere where Jesus says, teach this prayer to babies. These were his disciples. These were the apostles of God who were learning to pray because they had a big job to do. So right now, that temptation's inside is, well, I don't really need to do that. And, you know, it's, uh, I'm beyond that. I can just go in and pray because I've been doing this for so long. I'm not saying you haven't been. I'm just saying there's a right way to pray and there's a wrong way to pray. There's a better way to pray and a best way to pray. And the best way to pray is the way God said pray. It's really simple. You're not smarter than God. So if you want to have the ultimate success, do the ultimate obedience. Are we there? Last word. John chapter 14, verse 15 and verse 23a. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then verse 23a, he says, if you love me, he says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Now, if you love God, this is where it gets sticky at. This is where you guys either love me or hate me. If you love God, what will you do? And what did he tell you to do by prayer? You see it? He gave you the right. This is how you pray. Now, am I giving you a formula for prayer? No, God did. God gave you a formula for prayer. It is a template upon which you build your prayers. Now, like I said, there are other applications that come out of the discipline of prayer. And all those have their place and their time. But when you're talking about learning how to pray, this is the foundation for your prayer life. And if you do this, you will have success because God said so. Not because it makes you feel good, not because it tickles your fancy, but simply because it says so. Now, will we be humble enough to do what God said? I don't know, time will tell. Time will tell because if you do this, guys, it's going to change your life. It's going to change everything about your life. Just like getting married changes everything about your life or having a baby changes everything about your life or getting a job or being unemployed. All those events change everything about your life. If you submit yourself to God, it's not just going to change your prayer life, it'll change your life. So let's pray over that word. Uh, worship team, are you guys planning to come back after? I didn't, I didn't speak with you. Come on up, worship team. So we, it's always good to end it in worship and seal it in faith. So as they come, as the worship team retakes the, 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 the pulpit, I want you guys to just think in yourselves real quick. If there are issues in your life that you know that is not right with God, guys, can we, can we start by just being serious about that? If you have issues in your life, I don't need to know what they are. But if there's issues in your life that's not right with God, just lift your hand out. Let's just pray. Let's ask God to forgive us. Right now, just cross the church. Let's just be right with God. Because, guys, this is part of being righteousness. If we don't get right with God, how are we going to get the prayer we need? Let's just confess that before God. You, you pray to God. Take a moment and pray before God, and we're going to go on. Oh, thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up our, I lift up the saints of God. I just ask you to touch your people, Lord. You told us in your word, Lord, in 1 John, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. So I thank you, Lord, as your people confess that you are forgiving them right now. They don't have to jump through any hoops, Lord God. Your forgiveness is immediate. And I pray, Lord, along with that forgiveness, you give them instruction. If they need to make reparations or correct something or go ask forgiveness or give forgiveness, Lord, allow them to do that as well. Empower your people now to perfection, Lord, and we thank you for it. Now, saints as a whole, I want to ask you, how many of you guys want to have your prayer life made better? Anybody? 
Okay, then let's ask God to help us do this. Father, you told us in your word that we can do nothing good apart from you. And praying is probably one of the highest good things we can do, Lord. So we're asking you to help us to become people of prayer. We surrender our lives to you, to this purpose, Lord God, and we ask you to bless us, breathe on us now in the name of Jesus. Empower us as the people of God to become the light of the world, even as you have already said that we are. And I thank you for each person here and ask your blessing be upon them. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Let the church say amen. amen.